Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is Kaiser Report Summer Solutions. That's right. We talk about problems all year, and then uh, summertime, we come up with all the solutions. Now, today, we're being joined by banker turned Bitcoin entrepreneur Simon Dixon of Bank to the Future, long-term friend of this show, and as way of a bit of an introduction, his book, Bank to the Future, came out roughly 10 years ago. It actually predicted a major crisis in 2020 was almost clairvoyant in how that accurate that prediction was. Uh, Simon has also recently gone on record that he believes that central banks will go directly to people and bypass the banks with their money printing. That's now being discussed in the highest circles of banking. This is an amazing prediction that was made recently by Simon. Uh, he's the first, he's the best investment banker in Bitcoin and crypto. So uh, really a seminal character in the whole industry. Simon, I wanted to get started. First of all, welcome. Thanks for having me. No one gives an introduction like Kaiser Report. Thanks, Max. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, well-deserved. Now, the front page of The Economist magazine says free money. In one month, the United States printed more money than it had in 200 years. How much longer can this money printer go burr before the whole thing collapses? Well, that's the debate that's going to be had right now. So all of a sudden, um, as I said, we, we talked about this in 2010, that fiat money is ruined. So uh, you might as well have the government create as much of it as they like. And as, thank God a competing money supply came along like Bitcoin. So now you've got these three different forms of competing money coming along. You've got modern modern monetary theory whereby the governments just create uh, create all the money um you've got the middle um system which is what we've had for the last decades which is fractional reserve banking where the banks create it privately it's like a hybrid quasi capitalist uh, free market stroke crony capitalist regulated environment um which drives everyone into debt and then you've got private money uh, the next question is, do we have deflation or do we have inflation? Um, and that's really dependent upon who creates the money at the fastest rate. So money is being destroyed as all these businesses default on their debt, consumers default on their debt. And so the governments have to try and create the money at a faster rate. Um, and if they do successfully create it at a faster rate, then the number of defaults, um, then you could end up with asset price deflation and consumer price inflation, which seems to be uh, the trend that we're heading towards with all this uh, modern monetary theory. The consequence of all that money printing, and as you mentioned, they're having to print faster and faster, is the creation of the cantillionaire class. Those who are benefiting from the 0%, the free money from the Fed, those who are closest to the Fed, versus those furthest away from the Fed. And many of them are, of course, out protesting and rioting in the streets across the world at the moment. Do you see that as a causal and relationship there? Uh, is it correlated? And how do you think this cantillionaire class might react to the collapse of this fiat system? Yeah, so when money creation is um, created by a private bank as debt, and governments uh, create less and less money, which is the money that they create is cash and coins, um, you get one of the consequences of that is the, one of the biggest rich-poor divides, which is what we've experienced, which is you're pushing consumers into debt in order to save the economy. So they take on ever-increasing levels of debt um, in order to try and get, you know, to, to beat um, the inflation. They're all trying to speculate on real estate, um, which is driving them greater and greater into debt as their mortgage repayment doesn't cover their income. Um, so each and every month, you know, month and month, they're going greater into debt. And yet those that are the, you know, the closest to the cheap money, you know, the, the consumers are borrowing on credit cards and payday loans and paying extortionate interest rates, as you've always covered. Um, but those that are the richest and wealthiest and control the most assets um, can actually get access to this very cheap credit and they can use it for asset price in inflation. So Companies will use it to pop up their stock prices, um, and uh, the the uh, the you know you end up with this rich poor divide where the money is being used to prop up the rich's assets, um, and the the consumers and the the other class are all going deeper and deeper into debt, 
And so you just end up with this greatest redistribution of wealth that we've ever seen. Ever since Occupy Wall Street, there's been a lot of activism and protests on the street kind of focused on banks. And banks became a subject of a lot of these protests. Do you think we'll ever see a time when all those protests around the world, we call it the global insurrection against banker occupation, but do you think the rallying cry from the street from some point will be to stop printing, right? I mean, this is the opposite of what we have today because people, particularly on the left side of the political equation, are demanding more printing, more subsidies, uh, sharing, quote, sharing the wealth. But that's the problem is they're printing too much. Do you think they'll ever, the penny will ever drop, that they'll ever figure out that the problem is, please stop printing? No, I don't think so, because the people that are protesting in the streets right now are talking about the inequality. And rather than actually focusing, uh, you know, the, the inequality is a symptom, but the problem is systemic. And so really for those people rioting in the streets to come to the realization that actually too much government printing when everyone's asking for more, uh, businesses are asking for more, consumers are asking for more, we need you to now pay our mortgage, we need now you to pay our rent, um, you've shut down our businesses, we can't do anything. Um, so it's quite right that they should be asking for more when the government's telling them that they can't um, have their living. But that what they don't necessarily realize is that that can be the cause of the problem and the destruction of the system. Now, if they're so deep in debt, I guess that they really can benefit from their debts that they have to repay being cheaper in the future or even a debt jubilee. So I think that they'll be crying for more and more money printing and the destruction of the system um, but really, it reaches the point where the debt is so great that the rich need to be concerned now. Um, and that's really what I think that we're, we're, we're going to see next. Um, and I think we're actually going to see bankers protesting in the streets against central banks that are about to let them go bust. The governments won't give them the bailouts. They won't necessarily be able to bail in. And so the bankers, I think, are going to be protesting in the streets when the central banks actually uh, print all this money and start offering retail banking direct to consumers through financial technology companies um, is what I think we're seeing next. You know, that's kind of a genius point, really. And it, it, it's in keeping with what we're saying here. And, and remember, going back to Occupy Wall Street, the bankers upstairs in the, on the office towers on Wall Street were throwing money out the window, you know, thinking they're immune from what's happening with all this two-tier money printing that you've described. And uh, as you point out now, we're at a point where the central banks, if they go direct through to the, to the people using financial technology, uh, call it cryptocurrencies exactly, uh, a, a token from the central bank, they're going to uh, put these banks out of business. Uh, HSBC stock just hit a new all-time low. And, you know, and one of these big banks, like they did in 2008, could go belly up. You know, we saw Lehman go belly up, Bear Stearns went under. Uh, Northern Rock in the UK went under. It started the whole stampede of 2008. We could see HSBC or Deutsche Bank go under, a huge avalanche. And what you're saying is no bail-ins this time, no bailouts. We're just going to cut you off completely, and we're going to have bankers in the three-piece suits doing uh, on the street, joining the global insurrection against central bank occupation. <laughs> I think that could very well happen. Um, let's talk about the U.S. dollar for a second. You know, it is the it is the world reserve currency, and there's a lot going on here. A lot of question marks surrounding this. Your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I think what we see what we're going to see next is a 1944 style Bretton Woods Agreement monetary renegotiation, and so I think that obviously the U.S. will get a seat at the table as they did in the previous um, monetary renegotiations. And they're going to obviously try and um, you know, keep the, the strength of the dollar. Um, until the dollar is not worth anything, then it is still the strongest currency out there. In terms of fiat money, I'd rather have dollars than anything else at the moment. So you know, the fact that 70% of all, um, of all uh, you know, debt and transactions are all US dollars, and 50% of transactions actually happen in US dollars, means that everyone's got an incentive to keep it alive. They're exporting a lot of their inflation through the People's Bank of China to China, who obviously have monetary controls. Uh, they are borrowing, lending a lot of money to the US, and they have to swap in all those US dollars that they receive for Chinese yuan, leading that they have to print a lot of money. And they're trying to figure out where they're putting it. But really, I think 
the seat at the table of all these large super currencies and, and countries is going to be how much gold they have. And so that's essentially why, you know, the, the countries with the largest gold to GDP ratios are the ones that are going to have a seat at the table. That's Germany for Europe. That's Russia. That's China, who we don't fully know how much they got, but we know they've been accumulating more than they're saying. Um, and U.S. as well. So this race to the bottom, as you point out, in the fiat money world, the fractional banking world, the print is money to try to export your way to GDP growth has created this perverse incentive system where countries are trying to outprint each other. And But gold is not having it. Gold is not fooled. Gold's hitting new all-time highs in every major current, currency, including now the U.S. dollar. You know, against this backdrop, we saw the insanity of negative interest rates. And that, up until recently, was considered a financial impossibility. This never appeared in any financial textbook in history. And we also saw negative energy prices as well. But putting that aside for a second, negative interest rates, you've been in the business now many, many years. And how does that fit into your model? Well, negative interest rates are just a way of um, discouraging savings for, the, you know, for those that don't have access to the QE money. You know, it, those that have access to the QE money can can be on the right side of negative interest rates. And those that don't have access, um, essentially, they're saying, please don't save any of your money. We want you to spend it. We want you to be broke and we want you to borrow. Um, we need more money in the system. We need you to borrow more money. And so please don't have a pension. Please don't have a retirement plan. Please don't save. We're going to penalize all of that. And the smart strategy for anyone in this economy is take on as much debt and hope for a debt jubilee because that's where everything's um, headed. So, you know, negative interest rates are just a, 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 a signal to the world. Please don't save. We don't want you to. Good point. All right. Well, we're going to continue this discussion after the break. Simon Dixon, Bank to the Future, the bank, this, the, the platform and the book heading into its second decade. A must read. Don't go away. More with Simon after the break. Welcome back to Kaiser Report Summer Solutions with Max and Stacy. Right on cue, the storm clouds have moved in. A bit of a foreboding as we talk to Simon Dixon about the immediate future, banks, central banks, and cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and what people can expect. Now, Simon, getting back to our discussion Wanted to hit a couple of points here that uh, get your thoughts on. Paul Tudor Jones, very famous hedge fund manager. I've been following him for decades. He's put $100 million into Bitcoin futures contracts. He says Bitcoin is the fastest horse in the race. This is obviously now institutional money pouring into Bitcoin. Maybe just for the uh, audience, explain, because I hear a lot of people saying, well, those are Bitcoin futures contracts. They don't count. But uh, uh, Simon, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I think we are headed in the same direction as gold, where there are going to be paper versions of Bitcoin. Um, but you have to remember, and we're going to see during this Great Depression of 2020, uh, that there is a difference between gold and paper gold. Uh, we're already starting to see the absolute scarcity. The reason we're reaching new time highs is because people want their physical gold. Uh, people want their gold close to them, and the smart people are getting their gold close to them. And so all these paper contracts where there's not enough gold to actually uh, back all of these paper contracts creates a scarcity in the underlying asset. I think we're going through a similar situation in Bitcoin. Um, the big trend right now is DeFi and, and uh, you know, the, that's a lot of uh, on-chain um, yielding products and financial products. Um, but really the centralized financial companies that are building on top of Bitcoin solutions um, they're building paper contracts, they're building, you know, these different types of uh, contracts, but they eventually lead to a scarcity of the underlying asset because if you don't own the private key, then it is not your Bitcoin as the old mantra, not your keys, not your coins. Um, and remember, with all of these uh, derivatives and financial institutions, and now we've got banks um, custodying uh, Bitcoin, you know, they can end up owning them just like fiat money, they can end up spending them just like fiat money and they can end up creating paper and representations of them, but they are not the underlying. And fortunately, there's the Bitcoin blockchain where you can actually see, unlike gold, how much Bitcoin there is, how many more there are to be created, and the exact monetary policy, which creates the scarcest, hardest form of money that the world has ever seen that can be digitally spent um, globally. Don't confuse that for futures contracts, but when it comes to investors, 
and they tend to use these paper versions uh, because they don't want to actually store the underlying uh, because they're just trying to get exposure. And I think that's just going to drive a lot more people into the paper version, which eventually leads to a scramble for the underlying um, asset once those uh, once you actually need it, which is where we're headed. At the moment, of course, in the United States, the JP Morgan Bank is being um, prosecuted under RICO for their manipulation using uh, futures and paper gold to manipulate the gold and silver market. So uh, that would be interesting in light of what you said in the first half in terms of these bankers. I, I just really want to see Jamie Dimon like storm Grand Central right next to JP Morgan's headquarters and just like start start some sort of riot for uh, for the bankers. And, you know, in case for the audience, just so you know, we are in North Carolina, which is Hurricane Alley. So you could hear a real live hurricane coming through right now as we speak. I know, Simon, this is probably your first hurricane you may have experienced ever. <laughs> it is, okay. Well, um, let's talk further about these these futures contracts and that whole derivative space. Because other than this notion of an EMP or the uh, whole internet going down, one thing we always hear from naysayers is that uh, bankers are gonna take over this and they're gonna manipulate it like gold and silver and that this is the, thus a reason why one should not own Bitcoin. Do you agree with that? How do you respond to that argument? Uh, the way I'd respond to that market, uh, that argument rather, is uh, it's the same for every single market. So I used to be a market maker on the London Stock Exchange and my full-time job was to manipulate the price of stocks and shares up and down. So if uh, somebody was putting out a tip on the news or in a magazine back then. It was uh, Investors Chronicle and stuff like that. Um, then we used to push the prices up, push them down, try and create some activity um, and create some liquidity. But eventually, the long-term fundamentals prevail. Um, and we're starting to see that with gold at the moment as well. The reason that gold is hitting all-time highs is because through all the manipulation, through whatever all the accusations are, you can't stop the manipulation, unfortunately. Um, for short term, but the long term, you know, the fundamentals apply. We've already seen Bitcoin manipulated short term on many occasions. You know, so you see these ginormous orders going into the exchanges that make people dump the price short term um, and uh, people start speculating on who's selling, the, selling them. Um, some of the earlier, you know, uh, earlier this year, about 50 really early addresses in Bitcoin were sent to an exchange. These are all designed for manipulation. So you can get that in every single market. Um, but really, as an investor, focus on the long-term fundamentals unless you want to trade and start split paying some of these insider and manipulation games. Now let's go back to the sovereign layer here. You know, Bitcoin's this genius protocol of stacked of game theory. And it seems to go higher and higher up the ladder. And now we're at the sovereign level where the question is what state or group of states will start getting into buying or acquiring or mining Bitcoin as a way to add to their strategic reserves. And different sovereigns are now creating their own sovereign digital currencies. People are trying to figure out how that fits into the Bitcoin space. The Japan is going to introduce the digital yen. China is thinking about a coin, et cetera. And so a couple of questions. So when Japan appears to introduce the digital yen, uh, you know, what do you think about a national cryptocurrency? And the second part of that question is the, 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 the pushback you hear from people is that, well, what if countries outlaw Bitcoin? Uh, and that there is another thought to this that actually, as I was just saying, there's more likely that countries will want to get into competitive bidding to add to their strategic reserves and acquire Bitcoin. That's the flip side of that argument. But how do you come down, uh, Simon, on this? sovereign digital crypto coin now in the Bitcoin space? And how is that going to play out, do you think? So fiat currency is going to be 100% digital very soon. It already is in some countries. Um, the, the interesting thing that people confuse is um, people often think that, uh, that there's a, you know, the, the, the central bank digital currency is the same thing as what we've already got because the money's already digital and there's a war on cash and cash has virtually disappeared anyway. Uh, there is actually a major, major difference. It's who creates these central bank digital currencies and how they're created. So when a country actually creates a central bank digital currency, they issue it into the economy and they're going to have to figure out their models. I personally think the way they're going to issue it 
is as a result of allowing people to access their helicopter money as a as their individual universal credits or incomes. Um, and they're also going to issue it in proportion to banks going bust so people don't lose their deposits. So if you have some money at a bank, you can just get some central bank digital currency and the bank can go bust. Hence the banks are writing in the streets. Um, so I think that the, but it's not backed by debt as well as another interesting point. So it actually is a deleveraging effect when central banks issue these digital currencies versus the digital currency that's created by the private bank. Um, with regards to Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin gives people an opt out and an exit because when central banks and governments create the dig digital currency, um, it's going to be an awful effect on your privacy, your freedom, your ability to spend your money as you choose. It's going to be intersected with compulsory vaccines. It's going to be intersected with your ability to get on a plane in the future. Um, the anti-money laundering regimes and automated tax collections are going to be all intertwined. And we're just going to have more and more interconnection um, with these central bank digital currencies. So that's where Bitcoin really comes in. And then people ask, well, will they ban it? Um, we already have seen use cases. Um, we've seen that China banned exchanges, and it pushed the price from $3,000 up to the $20,000. Um, through a spe Obviously, part of that was a speculative bubble um, that corrected, and now we're starting to stabilize a bit more. So I think we'd be very naive to think that governments won't try and ban Bitcoin when they start to realize and it becomes a political power play. Um, and we already saw that, you know, with the uh, with, uh, gold in the past, uh, when it came to the monetary renegotiation, when too many people were hoarding and they wanted to increase the velocity of money, they banned gold and just simply made it illegal in America. Um, but at the same time, there was a two-tiered market, a market for uh, converting at the central bank and a market for uh, other countries. So what I think you'll start to see is current countries where their currencies are being destroyed right now that are experiencing hyperinflation or uh, debt, you know, over indebtedness, like we're seeing in countries like Lebanon. Um, I think they're going to have an opportunity to accumulate Bitcoin and then announce it as one of the reserves on their central bank. So fortunately, the competitive forces I think will make it where if one country makes it illegal, another country will see that as an opportunity um, and we'll start to see uh, this country uh, central bank level FOMO where the last central bank that announces they're going to hold some of their reserves in Bitcoin as well as gold and dollars and their currency um, actually become the biggest losers. Um, and so I think we're going to start to see Bitcoin as a political tool by central banks because it can be used by anybody. Let's talk about anybody because we talk about summer solutions here and we're talking about a renaissance, like a, a moment of rebirth. So if you're saying that all these banks, the JP Morgan's, Goldman Sachs, HSBC, Deutsche Bank, BNP Paribas, that they all go away, they disappear, they collapse. Bitcoin of, is, of course, your own bank. So what happens in a post-banking, post-fiat world? Like how much entrepreneurship, a flourishing of like fraud-free or, or a certainly reduced fraud environment? Like what happens? I don't think we're going to see a post-fiat world. I think fiat will survive. Um, it would just be in a different format. It's the, the fiat that you're going to see is going to have less freedom, less sovereignty, less privacy, um, and lots of really horrible features built into it. Um, and if banks go bust, it's, it's not that the banks go away, it's that the banks have a choice of either adjusting to the central bank digital currency. They don't get a super subsidy. They, they are no longer too big to fail because the central bank can just let them fail and there's a way of you know, auctioning off all the debt and replacing money with a central bank digital currency. So it, it actually drives banks to be more honest. And if they don't, um, perform that when they're not too big. When then when they're not too big to fail, they have to compete with financial technology companies that will all be building in this uh, fiat world. Um, now, all of those those uh, these different players that come along and they're all competing. Um, there is uh, you know this exit opportunity, which is that you can play on the the form of money which is digitally scarce and can't be manipulated. So I think that you're still going to see fraud. I think you're going to see fraud with companies building on top of Bitcoin like we have in the past. Um, all of these things don't necessarily go away, but they look like a new form. 
Um, and the most important thing is the competitive forces here. Users having the choice of where to, where to play and where to be. Use your fiat money, not because you have to, but because it's convenient for certain use cases, but don't put your savings in there. Um, and I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see every single financial product rebuilt in a decentralized way and in a more centralized way with two forces competing and consumers having more choice. Finance is going to get more complicated. Um, the shenanigans are going to continue. Uh, but the, the, the beauty of this is that you've got more choice and you do have a hard form of money and you don't need to rely on your government. Wow, Simon Dixon, great stuff. You know, you should add to your bio the term futurist you know you you really do qualify as a futurist you have predicted so many things that have come true thanks for being on kaiser report summer solutions pleasure thanks for having me well that's going to do it for this edition of kaiser report with max and stacy want to thank our guest again simon dixon of bank to the future if you want to catch us on twitter it's kaiser report until next time bye y'all